Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining for episode three of our Future of Foraging seminar series. Um, we have our two speakers today, um, Dr. Ahmed al Habi and Dr. Niels Colling, and we also have um, a guest panelist today, um, Alex Lloyd. Uh, so I will do just a quick intro for of our two speakers. Um, Ahmed will be going first today. Um, so uh, Ahmed is a, an associate research scholar at the Princeton Neuroscience Institute. Um, he has a very diverse academic background, actually, so crossing experimental and theoretical work. Um, he began his higher education studying for an undergraduate degree in pharmaceutical and physical sciences in Cairo. And then he moved to the Max Planck in uh, Godinen in Germany uh, for both his master's and his PhD. And there he worked on optimal network electrophysiology, which is an approach for modifying the intrinsic dynamics of cultured neur neuronal networks. Um, and then he joined Carlos Brody's group in Princeton as a postdoc to work on evidence accumulation in rodents, um, where he developed an interest in drift diffusion modeling and foraging. And now as an associate research scholar, he's been working on some very interesting um, uh, me mechanistic theoretical models that he's going to be talking about today. Um, should I, should yeah. I, go? Uh, I, I will quickly introduce Niels as well, just so uh, um, everyone knows who he is, <laughs> and, then, and then you can get started for sure. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, Dr. Niels Colling, our second speaker today, started with um, a, a, a BA in Physiology and Psychology from Oxford, um, and he continued actually with a Master's and a PhD in Neuroscience with Matthew Rushworth, um, and he stayed at the University of Oxford, uh, and in, in that time, um, in this Wellcome Trust funded PhD, um, he started to develop uh, um, ways of trying to uh, sort of challenging assumptions about concurrent decision networks. So instead looking more at distinct ecological decision problems such as foraging, which is obviously very relevant. Um, he then uh, was awarded a junior research fellowship as a very um, competitive fellowship, um, which allowed him further independence uh, in Oxford to pursue, pursue his research questions, um, working with experimental psychology, but also at the Functional Imaging Center in, in Oxford. Um, and he also then was awarded a, a BBSRC Future Leaders Fellowship um, uh, in the Oxford Center of Human Brain Activity, where he uh, worked uh, with the methods there, um, looking at temporally resolved neural data, particularly EEG and MEG in humans. He's currently um, a WIN Welcome Center, uh, sorry, he's a, currently a WIN PI, so this is the Welcome Center for Integrative uh, Neuroimaging, um, and has uh, got some very interesting ideas about foraging, which he will be talking about today um, in, in human. Okay, um, so yes, let's get started then, um, Amit. I will uh, make everyone else leave. And let's begin. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the organizers for inviting me today. And uh, today I would like to give you some uh, intuitions and ideas for how I'm thinking about uh, foraging this very cool behavior. And I hope I can get you excited about it as much as I am. And I will begin by where I live, the New York uh, celebrities, where we, if you have been to New York, you see uh, rats running around. Maybe some of them will carry a pizza like this rat who is going down the stairs in Union Station. And then you see he left the, the, the piece of pizza, looking back at it, OK, should I go back, take this pizza, or move on to another resource? It's not only rat who does this, but many other animals. For example, here we have the capuchin monkeys who live in forests in Panama. And what you see here in these videos are the trajectories of this um, uh, monkeys moving between these purple dots, which are the fruit trees. Not only on the ground, but also in the skies. We have this very cool creatures, the bats. These are the Mexican bats. And one can also track their trajectories on the Mexican shore here as they forage for food resources. So foraging, one can say, is a very crucial uh, behavior for animals because they have to self-sustain themselves through acquiring energy and search for food. It's universal. All animals do it. And as we have seen, it happens in the lab, in the subway, in the forest, in the sky. So it, it occurs on multiple spatial temporal scales. And it's also sensitive to environmental structures, as it happened in very different environments. Most importantly, it's quantitative. There is a long history in behavioral ecology in a quantitative formalization of foraging behavior. And recently, there have been a very strong interest in neuroscience to study foraging behavior. So what do I mean by an integrative approach to um, 
uh, what, what do I mean by an integrative approach to foraging? So here I have bats. It might be other animals. When, when bats are foraging, they can, when the animal is foraging, can, it can forage by itself or it can forage in groups. So what does it mean to have an integrative understanding for this behavior? First, one should look at the ecological fitness. It's like why this behavior is uh, improves the animal fitness. How does it improve the reproductive success and make choice? And then going closer, one can look at the behavioral algorithms, try to decipher them that the animal use to implement foraging decisions depending on the resource distribution in the environment, on its own experience, on its own bodily state. One can also look into how these behavioral algorithms are implemented, either in the brain or the body, in the animal physiology. And by what where an integrative approach for me will be relating these three levels together, ecological fitness, behavioral algorithms, and uh, a neural and biochemical circuitry. And because foraging also happen in almost all animals, it allows us to have a very neat quantitative and evolutionary comparison across animals. But today, I would like to focus with you on this behavioral algorithm, trying to give you some intuitions and some ideas about what kind of behavioral algorithms animals might be implementing in order to do these foraging decisions. And more specifically, I will focus on a canonical foraging decision called the patch leaving behavior. The patch leaving behavior is an animal enters into an environment that have some resource distributed in patches and every patch have some clumps of food. And the animal have, explore the environment, enter into a patch of food, consume some resources and then leave to another patch. And in such a behavior, uh, the observables are the patch residence time, in the patch, the travel time distribution between the patch and the food intake in the patch. And I am sure you have heard specifically in, in, in the great talk of uh, Alex uh, Kasalnik about the classical approach to optimal foraging theory, which is a marginal value theory. So let me quickly revise it. It assumes that the resources in the environment are clumped in patches, and it is a rule that tells me that that tells the animal okay you leave the patch when your current patch intake is equal to the average environmental intake rate and it's characterized by this curve if i plot the time foraging in patch with the cumulative resource intake i get this curve and at this time here this is the optimal time in patch but there is a lot of very strong assumptions of, as alex have warned us underlying marginal value theory optimization is that the animal knows should know that current food arrival rate, there is a continuous arrival of food, the animal knows the environmental food availability, and it assumes also that the environmental statistics remain unchanged throughout the foraging process. So whenever I mention marginal value theorem in my talk, I'm using it as some guiding principle and measure of comparison. Okay, so here there are two open questions that emerge that the marginal value theorem as a rule doesn't tell us is that how does the implement how does the animal can implement a marginal value theorem or a marginal value theorem like rule but then also what happens if the environment is uncertain or there, how to account for stochasticity or uncertainty in the foraging process so in order to address this question, along with my collaborators, Jacob Davidson at the Max Planck Institute for Animal Behavior in Constance and Zach Kilpatrick at uh, University of Boulder, Colorado, we have developed two modeling approaches that I'm going to cover in, cover in my talk today. First, a heuristic accumulator uh, model approach, and the second one is a Bayesian approach to function. So let us us jump into the models. First, the first model is called the foraging drift diffusion model. And for those who have, who have been in system zero science studying decision making, that's a familiar sounding model that we use to study decision making in system zero science. So let me explain the setting of the problem. Again, here, this is the patch leaving behavior. When the animal enters a patch of food, one can propose that there is a decision variable evolving over time. And whenever the animal receives a chunk of food or consumes some reward, which is here in orange, the, this decision variable tend to approach the threshold and then the animal will 
So in this environment, how do we characterize this environment? This patch, this patch have characteristics, like it has a food, a particular food density, which is this row node, and has a patch size, and there is also a food chunk size, and the travel time between the patches. So how would the animal solve this problem to leave the patch? So imagine yourself being this thread here, simulated thread here, that is entering into a patch. It has to keep track of two things happening. It has to keep track of how much in the energy of the environment is changing. And also, there is an internal variable that is tracking how much of food is consuming inside the patch. And what I described in Word is exactly these two equations. The first equation here is the estimate of the available energy, which is a moving average with some tau e um, here, which is a time scale of the update of the energy. And here, which is the growth rate of, of uh, food intake. And the decision to leave the patch, which is the second equation that keeps track of the food consumed inside the patch, is characterized by this decision variable x with some time scale and the drift rate alpha. And again, this growth rate of food intake with some noise term. So when does the animal leave the patch? The animal leaves the patch when this decision variable x reaches a threshold eta. And we will talk about uh, the threshold in the next slide, the threshold eta. So what happens if we simulate these two equations? It looks a bit familiar to some people who have dealt with the drift diffusion models, is that we have some probability density evolving over time. So if we begin at our initial condition here, and the, pro the, the, the probability density of our decision variable is evolving, and when, it, it, when, and when it receives a food, so it consumes a reward, it gets closer and closer to the threshold till it reaches the bound, the decision bound. Okay. So what about the threshold? So first, this, if we want to satisfy the criteria, as I said, we will use the marginal value uh, theorem as a measure of comparison. So if you want to, you, to, to satisfy the marginal value theorem, the threshold have to, be, have, have to satisfy this equation. I'm, I'm, I'm saving you all the revision uh, behind this, so just trust me about this, is that it has to depend on the patch size, on the drift rate, and the initial density of food in the patch on the average energy on the environment uh, and on a uh, metabolic cost. Okay, so how do I get different uh, strategies in this context? So the insights that we got using our simulations is that by varying the threshold and the drift rate, we are able to get different behavioral strategies. A class of strategies that we call an increment-decrement strategies, which happens when we have positive drift and positive threshold, and decremental strategies that happened when we have negative threshold and negative drift. Okay. So how does this strategy look like? An increment-decrement strategy means that when the animal finds food, it makes it more likely to stay in the patch. We will, we will see when this holds true. So here, what I am looking at is the, in, in blue here, is the evolution of the decision variable. So whenever I get a food, I consume a food, I get, I, I, I tend to stay more in the patch. It might find counterintuitive, but we will see when this holds true. The other strategy is decremental strategies, which means that finding food makes the agent more likely to leave the patch. So here again, this blue line tells me the evolution of my decision variable. And when I, when in this orange uh, text here, this is the food received. Okay. So how does animal switch between the strategies? As we said, the foraging is very sensitive to the environmental structure. So, so when the animal enters into an environment in which there is an uncertain patch density, the animal doesn't know the exact density in each patch. So what is the, opt the, the strategy that the animal might employ here is that whenever the animal consume uh, a chunk of food, it stays more because it doesn't really know the exact density of the food in this patch. And this is basically what happens if the, if the amount of food per patch is unknown, the animal uses this increment decrement strategy. So how can we really uh, deduce this if we plot the patch residence time, so the, the time that the animal stains the patch, by the patch food density, we find that there is some linear relationship between both. 
Okay. So one does the animals then switch the strategies into this decremental strategy. This decremental strategy happens when, for example, if the animal enters into an environment where there is an exponential distribution of travel times between the patches, but the animal have access or knows the exact number of food pellets inside each patch. So the, 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 the logical strategy is that the animal might employ here is that it enters a patch, begin to take a pellet of food, and when it gets one pellet of food, it is more and more sure that it has to leave the patch. We can also know this, that the decremental strategy is happening by looking at the histogram of the probability of the chunks taken by patch. So we have seen here that the animal can switch strategies depending on how much information it has access to in the environment. So just as an intermediate summary is that here we were able to propose a decision heuristic thinking how the animal will solve such a patch leaving problem by an accumulation process and a decision structure. And you were able to obtain a variety of strategies depending on the threshold and the drift rate. But the open question uh, for us was, can we derive this foraging decision strategies normally? And here we take a turn into Bayesian approach to patch forage. So what is a Bayesian approach? It's a statistical inference procedure. So you will have the agent accumulate statistical evidence about the patch uh, and the environmental quality. It has a long standing history in behavioral ecology, but the drawbacks of the current Bayesian models that, that exist today, that it was a bit restricted, does not explore a large parameter space systematically, and do not extend to learning environmental statistics. And also, the part in me that still a system zero scientist, it's these models are hard to relate or to fit to motion data, body posture, and neural dynamics. So then we thought it would be a great idea to model the whole um, uh, foraging behavior using a statistical inference problem. And here I would like just to uh, uh, introduce what happens when the animal enters its ecological environment. So it's two things the animal have to do. The animal has to search for a habitat, a habitat that have a lot of resources. So this is what we call the habitat choice here. And once the animal enters the, the, the habitat, there is a distribution of resources of pa over patches, uh, um, trees, for example, and it has to exploit this um, patches or select for the patches that are richer or poor. And we, we would like to model both of this habi habitat choice and patch exploitation using a statistical inference Procedure. So what is a, a statistical inference procedure in the Bayesian framework is uh, generally it, yeah, the, the agent or the animal will enter with some prior probability of the yield rate of the patch, how rich the patch is. And then when it enters the patch, it begins to encounter food. And as a more it encounters food, it updates its belief till it constructs an observer belief. And generally, we can write down the model equations in terms of the famous base rule, which might be familiar to many of you, that have this parameter kt, which is the number of food encounters at time t, and the prior probability of yield rate. Yield rate thus gives us a measure of how rich the patch is. And rho is the impact of each chunk of food on the yield rate. And over a long time, if we, if we simulate uh, the general model, the maximum likelihood estimation of the agent uh, yield rate approaches the true underlying yield rate of the patch. Okay. So let us first go to the habitat selection problem. And le let us give, us give you the punchline first, is if the animal enters into an environment where there are three habitats, and three habitats, the habitat, one can think about it in terms as if it is a non-depleting patch, a patch that doesn't deplete have uh, uh, over a long time. So it has a habitat that is rich, less rich, and much, much less rich. So let's think, how would the animal solve this problem? It should, the animal should search, keep on searching between the three of them, and ultimately should remain asymptotically for very long time in the one that have the most uh, rich resources. So this means that 
maybe what the animal is trying to deal with this is to minimize the time to find the high quality patch in order not to uh, delimitate its energy. But then also one might think, okay, if I have a lot of habitats that have high resources, that this discriminability of how salient this habitat that is have a lot of resources in the environment will strongly shape the animal behavior. So does this intuition hold formally? So today in the talk, for the sake of time, I will cover the simplest case. We have treated much more complex cases, which in which you have a binary environment that have two habitats, one that have a high yield rate and a low yield rate. Okay. So how do we write the belief here? We write the evolution of the belief over time using this stochastic differential equation that takes into account the food encounters and the lack of food. If this belief is positive, means that the belief suggests that the animal is in a high patch. If it is negative, it suggests that it's in a low patch. So what is the best strategy in this case is to arrive and remain in the high patch as soon as possible via a sequence of stay-go decisions, sequential decisions. So how does this stay-go decision looks uh, visually? If we plot the belief, the yt here, the evolution over time, and look at, okay, if the animal begins in the high patch, it stays a bit and then leave to the low patch, leave again, and then go to the high patch, and then ultimately it will stay for a very long time. It will leave the low uh, patch after a threshold theta and stay in the high yielding patch maybe forever. Okay. So what is the animal is trying to do here is to minimize the time to, uh, and to arrive and remain in the high yielding patch. And we can basically calculate this parameter, this time of arrival in the high yielding patch in terms of the threshold using this equation. This, is, this equation simply, simply tells me two things. It's controlled by two things. This part here is, is the number of visits that the animal should do to the high yielding patch in order to be sure, or its belief is sure enough that this is a high yielding patch. And this other uh, term here that tells me what is the time it will take to ultimately leave the low yielding patch. And using first, uh, passage uh, uh, time uh, statistic methods, we can estimate this parameter. Okay. So let's look at the parameter dependencies. So uh, just a note, when, whenever I, I, I talk about discriminability, this is the ratio of the high yielding, the, the yield rate of the high patch to the low patch. So how does the arrival rate in terms of the threshold change if I change the amount of high yielding patch in the environment. So if I keep the low yielding, uh, the, the, the yield rate of the low uh, patch constant, and I increase the yield rate of the high patch, the time to arrive there decrease. Okay, and we can basically exactly uh, compute uh, this relationship. If I keep the discriminability uh, uh, constant, but change the probability of high patch in the environment, the, the, the more the probability of uh, the high patches increase in the environment, the time to arrive there is um, lower. So the, the, the animal in this case is very, very sensitive to the prevalence of the high patches in the environment. What, what others can we compute? We can compute something called the, thresh, the optimal threshold, which we derive is not observable from the experiment, but we can derive from our model. Okay, what is the animal? What is the threshold that the animal is internally using? And this is very interesting hypothesis to test is that this optimal departure threshold will decrease with discriminability. So the more discriminable the patches, the, the threshold, the optimal threshold decrease, and we can exactly and quantitatively compute this. So what do we learn from this section? That in this habitat selection uh, uh, scenario, the strategy is to uh, minimize the time to find the high patch. And here we have a very strong deviation from the typical assumption of the marginal value theorem that hinges on optimizing a reward rate. Here I am minimizing the time to high to find the high quality patches. 
using uh, a procedure that that log likelihood ratio of the high to low patches over evolving over time. The second conclusion we can do is that the discriminability of the high patches strongly shapes the time and the strategy to find the high patch. So what happens inside the habitat, which is the patch exploitation problem, with, which we call here the depleting environment? What does it mean, a depleting environment? It means patches where the food depletes over time. So let's develop intuition what happens in this scenario. If you have this scenario with uh, patches here that have high, lower, and lower uh, um, yield rate, the animal will keep depleting and depart, deplete and depart between all the patches till ultimately they deplete all the patches. And here, actually, we go back to the marginal value theorem. So if we have no uncertainty about the yield rate, if the animal doesn't have uncertainty about the underlying yield rate of the patch, the forager strategy will obey the marginal value theorem. But if there is uncertainty, the forager strategy will deviate from the marginal value theorem predictions. OK, so how do we study this problem? So if we, we can study it. Again, in a simplified uh, uh, context, which is in this binary depleting environment that have high yield rate and low yield rate. What does the forager do? The forager should estimate the underlying yield rate, as we said before, and then departs when this falls below a threshold rate. Reminds us of when I talked first about the marginal values here. And this is the expression um, for the evolution of the belief over time. So to estimate the yield rate of the current patch, the animal should discriminate whether this patch is high or low and keep consuming food in order to estimate it. So what is the rule here? What is the animal is optimizing in this case is the long-term reward rate. And we can study this uh, in two idealized situations. is either a depletion-dominated regime which is that the animal knows the type of the patch it's entering and that the leaving decisions will only be based on the depletion. You can also study it in the uncertainty dominated regime where the type of patch is not known for the animal and the leaving decisions then will have to take into account this uncertainty in the estimate of the current yield rate of the patch. So in the first case, as we said, we expected that it will recapitulate the marginal value theorem. So using our uh, formal model, we can basically compute the optimal long-term um, uh, reward in this environment that will optimize for leaving optimally uh, from the high patches and from the low patch. OK, this might sound boring for some. But the more realistic case, when we have uncertainty in the environment that the animal doesn't know the patch type on arrival, then the animal will tend to stay longer in low patches and leave earlier from high patches, which is uh, over harvesting and under harvesting. Not only this, but we can quantitatively see how much they under harvest or over harvest. And this depends on the amount of food in the patch. Okay. So let us see what did we learn here in the depleting environments, in the patch exploitation. We learned that in this context, when you have depleting patches, that given no uncertainty about the yield rate of the current patch, the forager will totally obey the marginal values here. But if there are uncertainty, the, or the forager will under harvest high yielding patch and over harvest low yielding patch. And when the agent we expect the agent what it is doing here it's com it's tracking the maximum it's having is performing a maximum likelihood estimation of the arrival rate which is the yield rate of the patch over time so to conclude i hope i convince you that we have developed a highly flexible framework for modeling normative evidence accumulation and patch leaving decisions in two contexts, in this habitat selection problem and the patch exploitation problem. One very important conclusion is that uncertainty or certainty shapes the strategies of the animal in depleting environment. Something I, I haven't delved uh, a lot into for the sake of time is learning. But we have found uh, in our learning model uh, uh, for these parameters that learning that mm -hmm. the, the yield rate of the patch is quicker in mm -hmm. depleting environment.
So are we stopping here? Of course not. We would like to extend our models to social foraging. So what we will do it is, an, uh, uh, along with my collaborators, is to have an evidence accumulation model that includes social information transfer. So then the evolution of the belief will include private information of the person and a social information. So how does this, if, if we have two agents in an environment, how do they couple together? They can have a diffusive coupling, means that as they, is, as they are estimating the yield rate of uh, the patch, they help each other. So they, this is what we call diffusive coupling, so they can more rapidly uh, infer the underlying yield rate. They can have a pulsatile coupling means that when an agent leaves a patch, it basically sends a pulse to the other agent telling it to leave the patch. In a social uh, context, you can also have hierarchy and heterogeneity within the social groups. Most prominently, if you would like to look at non-human primates data, you can have dominant and subordinate subjects who will have different patch feeding behavior, who can have different patch departure behavior. They can be exploiters or explorer, and this basically also affect the way they estimate the yield rate of the patch. So, Till now, I only talked about models and conceptualization. And currently, we are fitting some of these models to uh, large field data that we have access to at the Max Planck Institute for Animal Behavior and Constant. But the only fitting to field data is very hard to really tease apart different parameters of, uh, of these models, or basically disprove these uh, models totally, maybe they don't, they don't hold. One can go back to the very controlled experiments that study one parameter at a time. But what I would like to propose is moving ahead, as I'm currently uh, moving, building a research team at the University of Constant, I will be using this imaging hangar, which is a very large uh, enclosure that allows us what I call a mesoscale type of experiments, where you can try to recreate the natural environment of the animal and monitor continuously over very long time. And I will leave you with this very short video uh, uh, by my uh, colleague Mate uh, Nagy to watch. So please pay attention. It used to be an old barn. The size of it is 15 by 7 meter and it's 4 meter height. So this is a tiny marker which reflects back the infrared light. The center of these markers can be tracked with sub-millimeter precision. If the animal is big enough that we can have several of these markers, then we can define uh, unique patterns which allows us to identify each individual. We can have up to let's say 100 individuals. So the future holds a lot, so stay tuned for more as I, uh, uh, as I move uh, to Constance. And at the end, I would like to acknowledge uh, people I've worked with at Princeton University, at CU Boulder and in uh, Brazil, and at the Max Planck Institute for Animal uh, Behavior and University of Constance and all the funding agencies. Thank you again for the organizers for this very exciting uh, seminar. Great, thank you, Amin. That was that was very um, that was great. Uh, we do have a couple of quick questions um, for, for you specifically, so uh, we uh, should go through those first, and then um, sure. we'll the meals. Um, <clears throat> so one question from Lawrence Hunt. Uh, in the situation where patches don't deplete, shouldn't the time that you invest in finding the most valuable habitat also depend on the time that you ultimately have to then exploit this habitat? Is this captured somewhere in, in the model? Um, uh, no, we have not captured this, but this is in mind. We can test it in the, um, in the experiment, and that's why I talked about the experiment, by setting a limited time by which I have to exploit this patch and see whether how much it deviates from our uh, predictions. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, and another question from Johannes um, uh, Algamissen, uh, which actually was something I was also wondering about as well. Um, shouldn't the animal have a, a rough guesses of the minimal or the maximal or the average resource richness of the patches? Um, is that somehow reflected in the priors of your Bayesian model? Yes. Okay, great. And, yeah. and would, would you get um, uh, satisfying under certain conditions? So no switching between patches, but staying within the initial patch if it's sufficiently rich? Uh, yes, so uh, I, what I didn't cover in the first model, in the first paper, we have a satisficing, you can get satisficing if the animal have certain risk, uh, you know, uh, utility functions, then you get satisficing. And uh, again, this will be tested in experiments, but definitely we can include in our models uh, satisficing if the animal have uh, particular shapes for its utility functions. Okay. okay. Um, we, I, I will... Uh, these these two questions are quite short, so I think we do have enough time. Um, you were right on time with your talk. So, um, uh, um, Marco uh, Bracic uh, asks, how costly is having a Bayesian updating system in terms of, uh, I guess, cognition or the cognitive system? Um, yeah, yeah. That is, again, yeah. I, I think the heart, the, um, yeah, I don't have a direct answer for the energy. The energy question is a, is a very difficult uh, a question uh, because also it will depend on the size of the environment because a lot of the, what is, what we try to push in our model is to, to we are trying to push now is to include space uh, in our model. So, because movement is basically a very costly thing. It's not only on the cognitive level, but I'm more thinking about the integrative um, level is, motion basically uh, uses a lot of um, energy, but it's definitely a very interesting uh, direction to pursue in terms of my energetics. Um, and, and one last question from Juan C. Um, this might be a bit technical, but how do you define the belief why? At some point you mentioned it being positive or negative. Um, is it a log probability? Uh, yeah, this is a, a log, log like probability ratio. So you can take it from the log. Great, okay. Thank you. Um, so I will now invite Hello, back on screen. Sorry, this is, this is the boring technical part. Here's Niels. Okay, great. Um, great. And if I just leave. Yeah, you can. Put me. Yeah. I'll, there we go. Okay, great. Hi, Niels. So feel free to share Hello. your. Um, yeah. The, the great. And just please swap. All right. So. This talk is going to be somewhat different because uh, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist um, interested in a more ecological uh, perspective on, on human decision making and learning. So for an ecologist or biologist, some of my experiments might seem a bit human or impoverished compared to what they're used to. But really, one of my major interests is to get inspired by ecological considerations and the kind of questions we can ask in human decision making and the way we approach the problem of how humans make choice and learn. And so, and the, one of the major reasons from the beginning of my PhD was because the vast majority of decision neuroscience has been inspired by a neuroeconomic framing. And what I mean by that is there would, a, a vast amount of energy has gone into trying to understand how we make this kind of decision between a bowl of ramen and a burger, the kind of thing that we haven't done for a long time, not going to restaurants and all, but it used to be very common. Um, and the way this has been conceived is as a so-called multi-attribute decision problem. So once you've identified the dimensions of value, such as flavor and texture here, you just integrate them into one universal currency and then pick the option of higher value. But you are probably the last crowd I have to tell this to. This is not very well capturing a vast amount of decision making we do on a daily basis and in real life nor is it what animals uh, have evolved to solve for a large part. So this parallel encounter decision, as some ecologists talk, talk about it, uh, is not what you get a lot. So for example, if you're thinking about going out of a house, you need to plan your day. You need to think about where, uh, when to leave, uh, where to go, um, how long to stay there. Um, and all these things um, are not very well captured with the other framing. Um, you're way more likely to be tracking how valuable things are over time and compute an average reward rate and a way more complicated version uh, of that you just heard in the previous talk. But this is just a, a little cartoon to illustrate that really knowing the, the, the utility of one option removed from all of that context and your sequential planning and your sequential decision making doesn't really make a lot of sense. And on top of that, uh, environments tend to be dynamic over time as well. So there's also an optimal time to engage with an activity. 
over another time point. And I've been spending a lot of time trying to get my head around some of that complexity when it comes to how the human brain might solve it uh, and able more adaptive and ecological behaviors. But really, our first attempt, which is some time ago now, 2012, was to say there's a fundamental distinction between the economist's thoughts about picking between two equivalent options and what we might call a foraging decision, where you're just comparing an environment um, in which you might search with something that you're countering in front of yourself. And that really basic comparison, um, we could link to the anterior cingulate cortex um, as being something it might be enabling uh, you to, to decide between, and that might be the dedicated circuit for that kind of computation, because it's a really important uh, decision to, to solve ecologically. It is something that requires very different input and requires very different behavior when you decide to forage or engage with a food item compared to a consumer preference decision or picking between things in front of you, like in a restaurant. But since then, I've identified a lot of other uh, cognitive phenomena that are very distinct to thinking about this temporal extended and foraging style nature of behavior, which aren't really present if you think like a neuroeconomist. And one of those I would like to um, exemplify with something that you might be able to relate to, um, which is the question of, of um, should I leave my job? So for example, you might be like me in Oxford, where everything is a bit antiquated um, and in black and white, and you might be longing for working in an environment which is a lot more modern with young people and all the equipment you might um, hope for. But you know, there's also Cambridge where everything is even worse than where you are at. Um, but you also know that London and DeepMind is around the corner where they have all these fancy deep neural networks and robots do all the work for you. Um, so there's a real variety in the environment and you might, while you don't know what you will encounter, you have a very good intuition of the job market. You know what's out there. So you don't necessarily need to learn that. And then you can conceive of the job market as a, or deciding uh, about the job market as a sequential decision problem, right? You might uh, encounter a job and you need to decide to accept or reject sequentially. And it comes very clearly if you think about it like this as a sequential decision problem that your time horizon or the amount of resource you have to budget is essential, right? While if you just have a binary comparison, things of immediate value, uh, you can just pick which you prefer. Here you really need to think, do I have enough money to pay my rent if I don't have a job? Or do my parents have enough money maybe? Or do I maybe get stuck with something bad because I'm running out of resources? And this is a really essential thing uh, for you to anticipate if you want to be very clever in the way you navigate your environment. So you have this initial planning decision you can make, uh, take into account the statistical properties of your environment and anticipated uh, um, experiences, and also anticipated costs over time. And you know that you might have to go through actually a, a couple of steps in your environment in order to get what you want. Um, so this is a version of the task we're running, uh, we ran. Um, this is uh, the simplest way we could uh, conceive of this decision problem because we run it in a large sample online. But the, we also did it in fMRI and the task looks a bit different. But here in the on, uh, online study, we try to keep it intuitive. So what you have to do is you always just decide whether to bank a win and the amount of points you already, you currently holding is on the top right corner. The current win is 40 points. Or you decide to spin, or in this case, spin again because they already spun. And that incurs a certain amount of costs each time. Uh, but this time they were out of luck. They have zero spins remaining. They could have up to 10 initially. And um, the way it works, if you spin the wheel, is that the dial happens to land somewhere, you get that amount of points, and then you can spin again or not. And the area indicates the probability of that number being drawn. So that's relatively intuitively, hopefully. Um, and so you can build a cognitive or a computational model uh, to try to understand how you might be thinking about the future when anticipating your sequential behavior. So you could start with the myopic value, your initial search. If I, uh, uh, if I um, spin the wheel once, what's the um, average value I will gain? But then you can have the insight of, well, I could decide to continue spinning and only accept good and amazing offer and setting that threshold, you can build this whole decision tree, right? And you know the probabilities of everything, accepting and searching. So, and then you know at the end you're stuck with the whatever happens. And so now you can find the uh, 
best threshold um, of accepting only good amazing here, for example, and you can encapsulate the whole thing as your prospective value. So what value is added to um, foraging or searching um, if I know about the future and how I will act within it? So now I want to move on to show you that there is behavioral evidence that people do do this, imagine future rewards, um, and how they motivate themselves to go through sequences and change their strategy. And then I would like to link that also to uh, its neural substrates. So first of all, the behavioral evidence. So this is just a logistic regression analysis. The y-axis is behavioral impact on searching. And on the um, x-axis is the specific regressor. And you can see the offer value has a massive impact. If the offer is good, you're not going to search. The same of costs. And the same with myopic value. If the average value of this wheel is really high, obviously you're going to uh, 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 venture into spinning. But also we could isolate this prospective element that goes beyond that immediate value. And that's partly dependent on the statistical properties of the environment, but also your time horizon. How much future do I have to play with? And we can also ask participants, um, that's an advantage I have because they're humans, I can ask them, do you feel like you were planning? And on average, I say two to three steps ahead. And they said they were thinking about winning eventually rather than winning right away. So that's also nice to actually have an ex uh, explicit experience of thinking about the future. But now having this uh, quantitative model, I can also tie this element to its neural uh, substrate. So I can look at signals that scale with myopic value, and I again identify the anterior cingulate cortex as well as dorsal prefrontal cortex, which is not too surprising to me because this myopic value is uh, uh, awfully similar to the search value I looked at before in, in, in the science paper. But what's exciting here is that even more prospective elements do really ramp up uh, dorsal ACC and dorsal prefrontal cortex activity. And then uh, we thought about something. We knew that dorsal prefrontal cortex and ACC are heavily uh, uh, connected with each other anatomically. So we thought, we know also a lot about the dorsal prefrontal cortex. We know it is involved with uh, planning and working memory in a kind of valueless domain. Um, so we thought that maybe they need to work together in order to compute prospective value in a way that they don't form myopic value. And the, the way we decided to, to test for this is look at their connectivity. So um, the, the analysis is called uh, PPI or physiological psychological interaction analysis. And all it measures is whether these two brain areas are more correlated with each other as a function of a psychological variable here, prospective value. And you can see there seems to be an increase in connectivity as there is a lot of prospection to do, but not with myopic value. And that's despite the fact that myopic value activates both brain areas to the same degree. So it seems to be a bit selective. So now that we've solved the, the kind of initial prospect prospection element and that decision, uh, we can also zoom a bit in a bit more into the tree, the idea that you know you are going to have a series to make a series of decisions. And one thing that occurred to us is in that sequence, you actually need to update your search value. You need to navigate and update your decision value as well. So I want to look at that. And to illustrate that, what I'm plotting here first is the search value as it goes down if I apply my model again and again after searches have been committed. Obviously, as you're depleting your number of opportunities or your horizon value goes down, but it can go down at different rates. So first you might, um, so and I can encapsulate that as the average change of the environment, but I can also look at the overall value change so far. And if I uh, um, analyze the choices after the initial spin, um, you can see people do take into account the value change. They don't just go with what they decided at the beginning, they actually until they say, oh, ooh, I haven't gotten what I want. Oh, now I only have a couple of spins. Maybe I should stick. And that's also what they tell us if we ask them. Um, they would accept uh, outcomes that previously would have rejected within a trial. So that's kind of cool. They do this very rapid adaptation. Um, and what's very exciting is if you look at brain activity right at the moment of initial planning, there already looks to be signals linked to the anticipation of that collapse. So you can, again, in green, see the ACC with prospective value. But now you can see in pink signals very specific in 8M9 in the uh, dorsal medial prefrontal cortex that anticipate that you will have to adapt your behavior rapidly. You would, well, now it might be a good um, 
time to search, you know value will go down quickly. So I have to anticipate having to change my behavior within that environment quickly. So it seems to be these two very distinct signals there. And some of you might ask for causal evidence that the ACC might be involved with prospection and thinking about alternatives in the Europe environment. So for that, uh, I would like to quickly tell you this story, uh, th this uh, study I was uh, involved in, uh, which is slightly different. So what the macaques had to do here is pick in every trial between two items in front of them. And there overall was a set of three and one was were not shown in a given trial. But every trial was another combination of the three. And if you do that, you can see this prominent signal in the singular cortex of the macaques that is highest for the best alternative that isn't chosen in that trial. And that might be because they are choosing to explore another one that is of lesser value, or because the best alternative isn't currently on the screen. So they need to think about picking that thing the next time around. That really seems to activate the ACC. So that can be seen in blue. And in the middle, in a time cost analysis, you can see the same emerging activity uh, as um, um, uh, just splitting up the th value of the three option ranked. But what is now exciting for causal evidence uh, is we use transcranial ultrasound neurostimulation or TUS to interfere with this deep medial prefrontal brain area um, transiently. And that's a technique you can actually hopefully soon do in humans. I might do uh, reasonably soon in humans as well. And what you can see there is some on the far right is that that TUS stimulation compared to CHAM, CHAM really reduces participants' ability to pick the best alternative when they're not um, uh, in, the, in the future. So that's maybe some partial evidence that there's a causal role for the ACC about thinking about your alternatives uh, in the future uh, and, and, and about choosing them. So I hope uh, I've given you some uh, um, interesting ideas about the uh, cognitive model for sequential search, which might be very important for foraging style behaviors and the neural substrates of that behavior and uh, how, as you navigate that environment and as it changes, you also have signals that are distinct that are about this rap rapid ap adaptation of your current plans that is essential for this temporal extended foraging type style behavior. What I haven't talked to you about is another key ingredient uh, of foraging, which is reward environments are dynamic. They change, seasons change, and they change in all sorts of different time scales. So they can go up like the green one, they can be stable like the uh, a blue one, they can go down like the red one. And if you are an agent that can exploit autocorrelations or structure in your water environment, that really serves you well. It serves you well in two ways. You can decide right now what's the best thing, but you can plan your environment, uh, how to navigate in your future environment as well, right? If I know whether or not what is going, then I can organize my time in a, in a really good way. And what I'm really excited about is the fact that you can actually predict reward trajectories um, really easily and neurally through a computation that you can in, uh, implement just by having neurons with different timescales. I mean, um, so uh, just to give you an intuition, if a short timescale neuron that only knows about the very recent past in terms of reward shouts, this is an amazing environment, and a long timescale neuron says, well, I'm not so impressed, that means it has been getting better, right? That's a way of computing a simple derivative, and vice versa. If the short timescale says, this is rubbish, the long time scale says, oh, this is still good. That means it has been get potentially getting worse. So through that simple comparison, you can compute the simplest reward trends. So first is the evidence for that diversity of learning rates. And we found in humans fitting uh, on the neural data, the, a, a learning rate or the times constant, you see this diversity emerge in the ACC and has been also shown in single cell recordings in different ways in macaques. And uh, in humans seems to be somewhat of an anatomical gradient and it also seems to exist in the IPS shown below. And excitingly, there seems to be a functional connectivity between uh, bits of brain in the human that has um, different learning rates um, as shown here in the bottom. So you can see in the bottom right, this diagonal suggests that similar learning rates in both brain areas are more highly connected with each other. So now we know there is this substrate in the ACC that could solve your reward trend decision-making, which is so crucial for anticipated uh, or prospective foraging. But now we want to show if the brain area involved when making those choices. So what we did here is that we asked participants to decide whether to leave environment or not uh, at exactly, I think, between 15 and 18 steps at this black dark line 
So, and what they experienced prior to that moment was either a decreasing environment, here exemplified in green, or an increasing environment exemplified in blue. And they always had to just simply compare it with a reference environment in red. And oh, if, if you are clever, you should pick the green, uh, sorry, pick the blue and leave the green, right? You can see that very clearly. However, if you have a very simple RL algorithm and only take into account the past with one learning rate, you would do the opposite. You accumulated more reward in the green one, so you should stay there and leave with the blue one. So what we can show now is the ACC seems to be very active uh, as a function of the goodness of reward trajectory. And the way it does it is by being really positively sensitive to rewards that occur very close to decision point and negatively to rewards that uh, appear very far away from decision point. And that would be a very simple way to compute this derivative of whether things have been gotten better or have gotten worse, right? So we have some evidence that maybe this very simple trend detection and computation might be going on in the ACC as environments change dynamically. But this is uh, very much on a time scale um, of like 30, 40 seconds, but we were also interested in whether people can anticipate reward dynamics on a fast time scale, um, likening it a bit to patch leaving. Obviously, that works on a very different time scale. But the idea is, uh, can people track continuous reward trends um, in order to make choices about patches and when to leave them? So what we did, because we're interested in continuous tracking, we used EEG this time, because it has a very high temporal resolution. So you can look at continuous monitoring. And in the middle, you can see just this little bar. Um, and that's the number of rewards they're getting at any moment. So every second, they would, the bar would jump about. And the way it would move is it would go stay, uh, start at a starting point, and then it would decay at a certain rate. So that's, that's actually quite similar, despite being a very different time scale, to a, a lot of patch foraging um, and MVT-like models. And what we, another trick we played is that we had different starting values for both patches. Um, and different decay rates, and they changed over time. And the dark black line is the true distribution, and the other, um, the, uh, the, the stepwise one, then we added some noise, and then the red and the green one is a Bayesian inference process on that that the person could have made to know what decay rate or starting point is. And in blue, you can see the update uh, process. But what, we, uh, what this does, is that allows us to have ex an experiment where at certain time, I mean, they first have to track and learn, but at certain times also the reward history is very rich. They have experienced a lot of good rewards and good patches, and then sometimes it's very poor. And from ecological theories, we know that that should affect when they leave an environment. And that's what we see behaviorally. Obviously, in this analysis, it's whether you leave at a certain leave probe or not. And obviously that's strongly driven by your current reward level in a patch, but it is also driven by your recent patch history, which is what, what, at the moment are patches really good or not, and you leave later uh, if, if they had been really rubbish. And reward change is literally just the derivative of this and the other step, again, showing that now in a very different time scale, scale the brain is very sensitive to the derivative or how too quickly is my reward changing or collapsing. And so now we can look at the electrophysiological data and focus first on these rapid reward events in a patch. And what we can do there is uh, use uh, time unconstrained um, uh, 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 de um, decoding analysis or TUDA, which is uh, based on hidden Markov inference and, and decoding. It's kind of the details are not so important, but what it can do is it's a very powerful decoding analysis in relatively complex decision paradigms. And if you use that analysis, you can see here the results. If you look at reward events on the x-axis, you see time evolving and the y-axis, uh, the decoder accuracy or variance explained. And the lines at the bottom are periods of significance. So you can see very rapidly emerging. Obviously, you have a very strong reward signal all throughout. Uh, but you can also nicely see uh, a, a very quick reward signal of the history and the uh, the change within the patch. So long-term history and the uh, change within the patch. And the topographies of all three are distinct. So obviously the next step would be to actually infer the sources in the brain because this is just on the sensors on the scalp, which I can do in the future uh, uh, using different methodology. But this is already quite encouraging to see that there's such distinct topographies of these different elements of a change in reward environment.
But what uh, I'd also like you to draw your attention to is that the way we did this is that they would actually only physically get um, the re or see the aggregate reward of their patch at the end of a try. So I get this big cash ca um, payout uh, at the end um, before the next trial starts and they enter the next patch. And at that moment, you can see uh, very interesting signals as well. So you can firstly see the accumulated reward signal, uh, which is very maintained. You can uh, in, in blue and then in green, you can see the leaving time. And obviously, if you want to compute an average reward rate, you can combine these two. So that's this uh, all important entity in ecological behavior, right? So it looks like this is computed very rapidly in the human brain um, as well in this uh, task. But uh, on top of that, we can even decode um, the subject, uh, whether you are willing to leave quicker or shorter the next trial round, independent of the average reward rate you just accumulated. So there seems to be the subjective element of when you receive reward uh, uh, um, that encourages you to stay longer the next time around or not. And then in green and in, in, in yellow, you can see this other entity, which is a long running reward history. So the reward history is um, literally just uh, um, the long running average of this average reward rate, which is accumulated uh, divided by leaving, accumulated reward divided by leaving time. And it looks like the brain is also uh, 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 tracking that at that moment when it receives reward. Uh, in fact, first you compute what happened in this trial on average, and then you integrate it into the long running average. And then that informs your next decisions and when to leave again, so on. Um, so the last thing I'd like to talk to you about um, is something that is a bit different. Um, so I've been talking about dynamic reward environments and how you track using average reward rate, but reward learning and ecological reward learning isn't just learning about averages and trends. Um, and uh, an anecdote I like uh, to tell in this context is, is this one. So this is a picture, uh, my graduate student must have heard this many, many times, I might be bored of this by now, but um, Anyone else? This is a picture from a 1950s mockumentary that was aired in Britain, showing you uh, Italian spaghetti farmers harvesting spaghetti from spaghetti trees and then drying them in large warehouses. And apparently about 60% of British people in the 50s um, uh, uh, believed this, which tells you a lot about culinary sophistication at the time. But um, I'm not just showing you this to make fun of the British. Um, I'm showing you this because an RL algorithm or a lot of economists would not care about this spaghetti tree if they like apples and spaghettis to the same degree, there wouldn't be a surprise or prediction error generated because it's just about value. So what I'm emphasizing here is that there are value neutral reward feature prediction errors uh, in real environments that are essential for survival. If something is of value, it's also of value to pay attention to its features. And she should be really uh, surprised by this picture if you didn't expect spaghetti on trees, right? So um, that's what we wanted to get at in this study that I did together with a graduate student, Jan Grohn of mine, and Matthew Rushworth. So here we had macaque monkeys in this MRI scanner. And what, wh what they had to do was very simple. They had to press a left touch sensor or a right touch sensor if a square appeared on the left or the right side of the screen. And they would see a three, two, or one drop of juice if they were correct, and, and they were almost always correct, or zero uh, drops if they're incorrect. But now the genius um, uh, uh, of this task is um, at the way you manipulate the schedule. So sometimes you would get long uh, stretches of uh, um, the, the, the square being on one side, and then it would appear on the other side, and then vice versa. And that would create visual spatial prediction errors. Right? And then we can dissociate these from reward prediction errors in the brain, so different kind of learning signal, um, by having two dro uh, three drops and one drop and three drop and one drop most of the time, which averages out to being two drop uh, expectation, but generates a lot of positive and negative prediction errors. However, sometimes we would give them two drops, and that should be, according to this utility um, uh, model, really neutral. You shouldn't really care because it's really what you expect on average. However, it is an experience that is very rare for these animals. So if they care about their reward experience, they should be really surprised by this. And so um, we run this uh, schedule, but then we also made one crucial manipulation. Sometimes the sessions were 
really stable, so nothing else changed. Um, and sometimes free drops became a lot more frequent at some point, and then one drop became more frequent. Encourage them to pay attention to the reward because there was something to learn in general. And what happened then is that we find the visual spatial prediction errors in both the prefrontal cortex and parietal cortex. Anyone who knows a lot about attention in the brain wouldn't be surprised to hear this. Uh, but it's very distinct signals from the reward signal. So we already have two different prediction errors, one of value and one of space. Um, and that value prediction error was in the ventral stray uh, term, in the VTA, all the brain errors you might expect for, for reward learning uh, in the subcortex. But then we found this very prominent signal in the orbital frontal cortex in the OFC for this reward rarity. So that brain error really seemed to switch on, but only in the changing reward environments as you could, uh, encountered an unusual reward experience. So what we take from that is that if you pay attention to reward environment, if experiences happen that baffle you, the orbital frontal cortex in macaques really activates. And that's a brain area that have, um, that's previously has been associated with credit assignment and inference and hypothesis testing. So it seems to be the circuit really when you navigate your environment of like trying to pay attention to these kinds of features in order to improve your behavior in the future. And it really contrasts to the ACC, which really pays attention about your environment, but doesn't really sense necessarily care about reward features, but about trends and how your involved environment is developing uh, in the greater scheme of things. So to end things, I'd like to um, just maybe tell, uh, kind of may, hopefully I've convinced you that there's something interesting about thinking about uh, prospection and adaptation and predicting reward trends in the human brain and that it might uh, uh, involve the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex and other parts of medial prefrontal cortex um, and also involved in, in detecting reward trends and choosing based on these and that there might be some very rapid medial prefrontal signals uh, about detecting when environments are changing or collapsing in this uh, in this scenario, uh, pro uh, like really encouraging you to leave, and that there's some reason to believe that's a causal role for ACC in all of this for neurostimulation shown for neurostimulation about prospection, um, and that all these things could support or be building blocks neurophysiologically in the human or primate brain to enable more sophisticated ecological behaviors such as planning your day or indeed foraging in the wild where you thinking ahead and thinking about how you navigate your environment knowing about how the environment is evolving but also constantly monitoring and tracking your environment in order to build even better models of what might be going on in the future using the orbital frontal cortex um, thank you very much Great, thanks, Niels. That was um, very interesting. Uh, I can't see any questions right now, but I actually have a question if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, you were talking about the DACC um, in terms of prospecting, predicting reward trends. I think that's actually very interesting, especially um, uh, there being a lot of evidence that uh, rodents, for example, are very good at uh, sort of tracking reward rate, for example. Um, but uh, do, do you think there might be any difference in terms of which brain regions are involved if the individual like the human is actually the one controlling the trend itself so for example in a traditional patch foraging uh type you know you you, you are the the sort of organism that's depleting the resource right um yeah so uh, i think that will add another layer of sophistication um so if you have agency uh, uh on the reward dynamics um i i mean this is a really exciting empirical question uh, i suspect i speculate that the brain area just anterior the door, uh, to what I'm showing here in the ACC, this is a bit of tissue, do, uh, a part of the dorsal medial, it's medial frontal pole, is involved in simulating other agents and other um, the actions of others. But I think it could also in theory simulate these self-generated self dynamics. So I wouldn't be surprised if that bit of tissue then would track the rate at which you're depleting your environment, the rate you have agency on your environment. But that's a very interesting uh, empirical question you could test of whether that tissue or another bit of tissue does that. But from what we know about its role in simulating agency specific or like uh, actor specific changes in the environment, that could really serve it well to do something that it does in social cognition, also in a non-social context. Great, thank you.
Um, and actually, I might be cheeky and ask one more very quick question myself. Uh, so uh, w one thing that, um, I, again, I, I really like the range of uh, the, the design, the task designs and the studies that you spoke about today. I think it's really uh, that they, they sort of um, both capture a lot of different aspects of the sort of ecological uh, patch foraging problem, so to speak. Um, one, one thing that I uh, thought, you know, uh, that I wasn't sure I heard about was sort of the cost of traveling from one patch to another or sort of traveling or there's sort of more integrating spatial problems uh, in terms mm, of the yeah, patch yeah, yeah. Uh, foraging issue. And, and I'm kind yeah. of curious as to whether you think that is, do you think there's something potentially fundamentally different about how a human, for example, might approach this kind of problem? Because uh, we can conceive of, you know, making the kind, like in the first study that you spoke of, right, where you're deciding, yeah. uh, you know, stay or go, but it's not yeah. quite go, is it, right? Like it's, yeah. it's it's gone to the next decision. And and I, I just wonder, you know, do, do humans approach this kind of problem differently to maybe rodents, for example, that are very spatial? Um, or I, yeah. think that it's the way that the tasks have been designed that uh, sort of, anyway, sorry. That's yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Having worked with rodents myself, like I, they are very spatial animals. They navigate the environment and they, they, they forage in a very different way. They think in a very different way. But primates and other primates like humans, they're very visual creatures. So I think they can actually look ahead and plan uh, along, uh, along long distances and think about their world uh, using um, kind of um, hypotheticals and so on, in particular humans. So yes, I think, and also remember some of the brain areas I'm talking about, particularly in the lateral prefrontal cortex and so on, are brain areas that don't really exist to the same extent in a rodent, right? So this most sophisticated perspective foraging, I, I, I do believe happens uh, to a larger degree in, in humans and the sophistication of our foraging is higher. Um, but that's the beauty of foraging. It's something that gets reinvented again and again with increased sophistication, with ways to adapt to simulating the way your environment works as a species and so on. So I, I do believe uh, rodents forage differently and, and, and adapted to the way they navigate the environment compared to, to humans. But there are some commonalities and the anterior cingulate cortex is one of these things that has, is relatively preserved because a lot of types of foraging need to track these basic parameters like average reward rate and so on. So that I think is one of the elements that is pre preserved and then you get some things added on top in a human that allows you to do it in, in, in different ways as well, I think. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, so we do have one question from the audience. This will, I think, be the last question uh, just for you. And then we'll um, sort of do the panel uh, chat and everything. Um, but M Marisol asks, would, would you please illustrate a little more about the brain's response to changes that imply a change in direction? So either increasing the gain or decreasing the gain and sort of what the biological reason for that is? What, what, why the brain should uh, care about these trends? Um, yes, I think so. In yeah. The, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so because if you can anticipate when a reward environment is increasing or decreasing, that if that's reliable, that's incredibly important information for your choice, particularly if decisions can't be made all the time, right? So if it's a question of leave now or leave in half an hour, then anticipating trends is very valuable. If you can leave any millisecond, trend estimation isn't quite as useful because if it's going down, you just wait another sample, now it's down and you go, down, go away anyway. But particularly in more organized environments where you need to commit uh, for longer periods of time, um, take uh, uh, um, the, the, the British cocktail party example. It's very rude to leave a, a, a party, uh, but sometimes when somebody else leaves, you can leave at that point, but then you might be stuck for an hour, hour if you don't. That kind of scenario, knowing whether the party's just gone stale is really, really important. Lovely. Thank you. Okay, um, I will close. Wait, uh, actually, can you un unshare now? Or yes. Or, okay, yes. thank you. And then I will start the process of inviting. I can find the right button. Back in. Yes. Okay. Uh, hey. I am sorry, I'm hey. just inviting hey. everybody okay, else. Make sure I don't forget anybody as well. <laughs> um, and so, as I mentioned before, so Alex is accepted now. So we we have our guest panelist, um, Alex Lloyd, um, and Alex is currently a PhD uh, student at um, Royal Holloway, the uh, University of London. Um, 
And so, uh, and he does actually some really interesting work I, I sort of on adolescence and foraging. Actually, I, I saw it was very interesting. Um, so, anyway, yeah, uh, I don't know if anybody else has questions since I've, I've taken up most of the time so far. Um, I had a question, if that's okay. Um, so, I guess in sort of the theme of you know a unified framework of foraging theory, um, do you both see a place for a complementary role for reinforcement learning and the drift more the drift diffusion stuff that Ahmed's done? Because in my in sort of my view, it seems as though reinforcement learning captures kind of the valuation of whether or not you stay or leave, whereas drift diffusion sort of seems to capture the actual choice process that goes into that. So I wondered if yeah, you both have a, have thoughts on whether or not they could complement each other in a slightly alternative model. Um, yeah, I definitely complementary. Uh, like that's sort of one of the next steps we are taking is like how can we have as you said exactly like having the RL involved in the evaluation, but then also in the learning process in the environment, because all what I presented today is that the animal knows the structure in the environment, but more, my, you know, gut feeling uh, is the structure learning first will involve our elements, and you can have uh, the more mechanistic type of models like the diffusion. So I don't see them as like um, opposing or different classes that can complement each other in this uh, processes. And then at the end, the last word is also for the empirical evidence afterwards as we try different situations. Yeah, for me, it's also uh, how narrow you define reinforcement learning. If you yeah, define yeah. reinforcement learning as so, literal synaptic change and this incremental over time, this memory element, then uh, one part of the answer is time scale, right? That reinforcement happens on a particular time scale. But I've used RL models to for for this uh, reward trend computation that happens really rapidly. And all I'm using there is an update rule, uh, an update rule of like value, like expectation and uh, an error. And that's like that's a mathematical way of thinking about RL. But I mean, it depends on whether you ask a psychologist or a computationalist what RL is really. Um, so I, 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 yeah, I think the the most broad definition of I definitely I think is is it's 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 just a beautiful way of thinking about updating uh, like and tracking an environment. Um, but my suspicion is on particularly long time scales, even the narrow definition of a old school psychologist, animal learning person will be really relevant. That re type of reinforcement will be really relevant for how animals forage and how how they de determine whether environment is good or not. Mm -hmm. I suspect that that re type of reinforcement will be very important for that. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I, I myself have a, another sort of broader question, I guess, um, that, that I've been thinking about a little bit uh, as somebody into patch foraging and um, especially inspired, I mean, actually by both of your work, right? So Ahmed, because you, you, your, your modeling is very extensive, you're trying to capture a lot of the different features um, that sort of arise as part of the patch foraging, for, foraging problem. Um, and, and Niels, you know, working in humans, obviously there's a lot of complexity there. There are lots of different ways that, that the problem can be approached. And I guess in, in a very general sense, do you think it makes sense to approach the problem in this way? Does it make sense to and have sort of one idea of what patch foraging is as something that we can try and solve or model in, in one sort of cohesive way? Or is it, are there sort of different processes? For example, Niels, as you mentioned, this idea of tracking prospective reward, that in itself is one process that is important, obviously, for um, being good at patch foraging. I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm, what I'm asking is like, sort of at what level should we be solving this? And at what level can we then relate it back to physiology as well, right? Like, I mean, if we're thinking about uh, physiological correlates, again, does it make sense to, to sort of have all these different aspects and try and integrate them in, in one way? Is that something that we might see represented in the brain? Or should we be looking at the finer details and then trying to identify again, like physiological correlates, for example? I'm just curious what, what you guys think uh -huh. about. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned in my talk, I believe in this integrative approach. So even if I am trained as a neuroscientist, I also, you know, the brain have a body and there is an environment. So there is like a contribution from the same. So I would be on the side of to, I'm here to understand foraging, not a particular uh, process. And as I said in the slide, you can have from people doing like evolutionary arguments and then uh, why it evolved and uh, the advantage of foraging it happens in many species, then if you can develop uh, some quantitative measure to compare between species, it would be really nice to also have some understanding uh, what did natural selection act on. Because a lot of time, neuroscientists act they are as if they are creationists, you know, as if this uh, arrived haphazard. So, and the uh, second thing in terms of, yeah, this behavioral algorithm I talked about, I always thinking, okay, the 
uh, it gives us more richness to understand the brain dynamics, as as Nils have, have shown. It's like, you know, the more you have some cognitive models of behavior algorithm, it gives us more understanding of uh, uh, brain dynamics. So I would advocate for like delving a bit more time or spending more time on the behavior algorithm size in order to better understand actually physiological implementation, not run directly into the brain, and then you can have like less rich uh, understanding. So that's where I come. Yeah, from. yeah. So, so I think if you think if you imagine ecological, mm -hmm. I think there's loads of different kinds of problems that are ecological yeah. that are distinct, and you shouldn't mash them necessarily all together. Like there's prey predator uh, uh, problems and patch leaving problems, but I think when you think about patch leaving or a particular class of problem, I think we need the necessary complexity to actually even engage the brain areas we're interested in. And I think we've, as a field in cognitive neuroscience and humans, had this problem where our paradigms were way too simple that we didn't necessarily see the mechanisms we were interested in because we made it so mind-numbingly stupid that, the, I mean, you see the prefrontal cortex just turning off because they don't really need to make a decision. So we really need to take this seriously, that we need to have the necessary complexity, uh, complexity to actually solve the problem meaningfully. And that's very different depending on the species you're working in. A rodent challenging task is not a human challenging task, right? So you need to adapt, you need to take your species seriously. Um, but then again, obviously you can't make it too complex. It needs to be tractable, right? And that's what I love about thinking about ecological models is that it gives you an idea also through evolution or that what might be necessary elements that we really adapted to track what might be important complexity and that's what i like about it is that you're not just arbitrarily throwing some complexity on for complexity's sake and that's what i've been struggling with a little bit in the previous 10 years 20 years with a neuroeconomist framework they have this one beautiful model how you make any arbitrary kind of choice but then they're done they don't have any idea or hypothesis how different choices could be different and evolve different brain structures and what challenges might be different from other challenges because it all boils down to valuation evaluation and that's arbitrary numbers that you can assess for any activity and you just memorize those and compare them and i think that's not how we work as, as uh, humans and animals and just to add to Nils here is like the argument first was for the very simple uh, models is that this is we have to control everything because this is how we will understand uh, the brain. But as as he have shown and many others as it's the community this commu community now is growing is that by adjusting the complexity the right level of complexity and this is a, a very difficult uh, question you can still get into uh, interesting mechanisms that you can pin down. But to to, uh, to think that if I control everything, I, I, I can understand it, you end up with basically maybe uh, some artifactual or artificial like understanding of how decisions are made. Yeah, I had a graduate um, student who had this beautiful example of aliens going to Earth and trying to understand a car, but putting it on a pedestal and then never driving it and never understanding the car because the car is for driving, right? Uh, we are... We, we, we live to survive and we do these ecological things, but you could spend decades trying to uh, understand a car by playing with a radio. Right. right. And the radio is meaningful, it's a part of a car, and, but it's not what the car is about. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I think that's something that we have neglected a little bit. It's like just understanding the radio is so beautiful, right? It's so e it's, it's, it's relatively easy. There's a couple of buttons we can play with and we can have this really controlled environment, but really what we should be asking is what is this object about? First and foremost. Yeah, and this brings the evolutionary like perspective. It's like why was it like designed by natural selection in this way? Is yeah, yeah. Uh, and foraging sounds to me is a, a very like one of these like basal behaviors is like you know sustaining uh, the animals like mate choice or production is just sustaining. The I, 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 and then it can still mean that it, the answer is we are not like a cow. We are more like a Swiss Army knife. Yeah. We have many yeah. functions, right. but still we thought about what these important functions are, not just peripheral things that happen to be really tractable. Um, I, yeah, and this type of thinking also let us think about constraints, like what what constraints the behavior either on the short time scale, the environmental ones, but then also the long uh, time scale. A lot of time also we uh, 
either cognitive or systems neuroscience don't think in this temporal dimension, like what happens on the short, intermediate, or longer uh, time scale. So there are different optimization yeah. which might be levels of problem. I think that will hopefully be one of the new frontiers, particularly when we talk about humans and primates. Right. It's thinking mm -hmm. about behavior on a different time scale, which we are mm -hmm. very much neglecting because it's so impractical. But a lot of behavior and decision making and, and, and all that stuff happens on different time scales. Right. And right. We're really constraining ourselves to think about trials in 10 seconds and 20 seconds, particularly in human neuroimaging. But we need to find solutions on different time scales to understand brain and behavior. And the mechanisms might be really exciting, but very different, right? If you right. make behavior on hours and days, you might do it very differently. And continuously like this, no. I always thought, of, you know, I did like trial based uh, behaviors, but then only by doing them, I understood like, okay, the argument for trials is, okay, we can have repeatable trials, we can analyze the data easily, but but behavior unfolds over continuously. So we, we can do the hard job of finding ways to extract some information from this continuously unfolding uh, behavior, as, yeah. as you mentioned. Yeah, and I think we're getting more um, methods to do that. Right. There's right. now hidden Markov models and other mm -hmm. ways of analyzing time series data that, that we didn't yes. have before that we can yes. really yes. use to understand data that we didn't pre-plan in terms of trials. And yeah, it's a, you can guys, you can interrupt us in case we go long. But uh, it's a, the other thing is that with the technology, all the tracking technologies, you know, with the body posture and stuff, talking about animals, is that you can only you can also get what it, you know, as someone who thinks not only about the brain, but about how the different like embodiment of the behavior is that this technology can also be incorporated in our models. It's like is the, is the animal when and uh, if the animal leaving a high yielding patch, for example, does its velocity increase? Uh, 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 we can see a lot of like even bodily correlates for this. So we have now this technology to really uh, use it uh, now to address these questions that are happening over time. Yeah, yeah I'd just sort of like to add that, you know, this is very much kind of in line with, with what I'm interested in, in terms of thinking about how a highly ex um, exploratory strategy for adolescents might therefore be uh -huh. later beneficial for them exploiting stuff later in life. So I think what you're speaking to is, is really important. It's definitely something that I'm interested in as well. Yeah. You have really pointed, yeah, I forgot to say development also. We don't think about development, like, you know, the, the whole, like, do the foraging strategies, if I do the rat experiments, like, that, that I uh, hopefully will uh, will be doing, is that is uh, is a baby, is the kids, like the ones who can walk around, will adopt similar strategies uh, to the parent. And then now we are talking only about a single forager. So some of the extensions I have talked about in my talk is that, what about social uh, uh, foraging if we have, uh, other agents and we we basically change social information continuously yeah i completely agree. i think development is really important but also i think a comparative approach in terms of species it's like right, right. we in neuroscience we have this lazy notion that like i can go from mouse to human and i have the same brain area record from it and it's the same thing but we really need a better model of what is the ecological niche what's the behavior and, and a rich representation of what is the behavior repertoire of each species right, right. And, and because that will map the comparability and that yeah. might even tell you something about the function of a brain area because that might not exist in the same way in a mouse as it does in a human yeah, and by yeah. knowing how their behavior is different yeah. and how the brain is different you might learn right. something right. but yet it's inconvenient because somebody wants to work on a mouse model and then wants to talk about a specific brain area and then talking about these complications often is something we don't want to think about because it's always phrased in a destructive manner. It's like, oh, that means you don't have this brain area, but we could talk about how that actually can be a rich source of information. Yeah, I totally second you. This is why I was saying they act like they are creationists. Uh, if, you know, don't take into account the ecology or, or how it would shape and change. Definitely would be different. The comparative approach is really uh, is really crucial. And now, and specifically foraging, because it's not like a highly specialized um, uh, behavior, we have the opportunity to really do comparative work across uh, um, the species from starlings. I, I mentioned my talk in Constance, there is like behavior across multiple scales, and then you can do some comparative um, approach.
Um, actually, on this note, I mean, a lot of the topics that have just been brought up, it's a very interesting discussion. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience that kind of tap into a, f a few of the things that um, uh, we were just uh, talking about. So, uh, for example, um, Marco Bracic asks um, uh, to Ahmed in particular, like, how do you envision integration of animal emotional uh, state in the foraging theory and, and, and your models? Um, which I guess is another dimension, right, to, to think about alongside development and other other. Dimensions. Yeah, so if you, you know, and I, I think it's it would be like a feedback with the experiments and models. So let's say you, you adjust the stress state, have more stressed animals, and then you see which parameters of your model it affects, and then you have, can have like state dependence. So you can have like a state dependence definitely included in, 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 in the model. And I feel like stress will be a more quantifiable uh, emotion than other uh, than uh, than other uh, ones, but also in social foraging, if you have like two animals, I would say three. Using this new like uh, uh, postural analysis, you can get into you can infer what kind of emotions do they have. Like are, are they like cuddly a bit together? Are they fighting? And then begin to differentiate what like modes of foraging they are adopting. And definitely, this can also be included with some state dependence into the models. And, and since we were also sort of mentioning uh, physiology as well, um, uh, so Alison Comrie asks uh, that uh, we've heard about representing hypotheticals and prospection today, um, but not so much about the medial temporal or the hippocampal system, which may play a role in this. And so how, how do you view the role of the hippocampal system in particular in interacting with these frontal, cortical and foraging systems as the subjects build dynamic internal models of the world and use them to navigate between patches? I think that's a very interesting question. Yeah, I, I think the hippocampal system is, is, is essential for a lot of navigation behaviors, uh, as we know. And it just, by the nature of the kinds of task I'm running, where I'm really stripping away a lot of the navigation elements, because I can't get people to run about in the scanner, I, I, I sadly am lacking this. But I think in the future, I'll, I'll do some studies in, in real cages and macaques uh, in like the home environment for hours and things like that, potentially. And there you could imagine having a lot more spatial sense and then obviously uh, uh, hippocampal structures would, would be feature a bit more prominently um i think but absolutely i think it's, it's essential for structuring your environment and navigating your environment and particular complexity not just spatial like structural yeah. knowledge is also interesting ideas about how structural knowledge and hippocampus yeah. interact and and funnily enough it also what pops up is the medial prefrontal cortex together with hippocampal systems are really in, in, important for structural knowledge, exploiting that um, and planning with it. Yeah, I think, and I'm thinking about sort of the dopamine system as well and how that could interact. If you have this sort of, um, you know, it's typical of me, but like, uh, you know, if you have like some kind of internal model of the of the, space, the sort of uh, foraging space mm -hmm. in which you're working in, I mean, you can imagine sort of dynamic changes uh, and basal ganglia being very important for that. Anyway. Um, <laughs> and and uh, just to add, like, and the nice thing again about foraging is like, if you are recording, then during the behavior, you can basically track the brain areas that might be activated if you have like, more large scale electrophysiology at these processes, you can track which areas are activated when. Uh, and that, that's that's something that you don't get with other behaviors. Um, I think we, we have one last question from the audience. I think if you guys don't mind, we're a couple of minutes over, but um, sure, yeah. this is quite an interesting one. Uh, so um, from uh, Johannes Algemissen, um, uh, Johannes asks, uh, Niels, but all, you know, also everyone, have you assessed whether your human participants are introspectively aware of the changes in the reward rate and the prospective value? Um, and does this metacognitive awareness link in some way to task behavior? So, for example, being over optimistic or, you know, confidence. So can so over planning hurt? So there's two things about this. So there's a couple of things, actually. So, yes, they do notice that things are changing. But we also find we have a large we've collected a large sample of 600 people online. And we find these very intriguing associations between clinical dimensions and individual differences and how they interact with the environment. So if you're very compulsive, you are more likely to just go on despite costs. Um, but what is interesting, what we also found is that there is a metacognitive awareness of that. So uh, compulsive individuals will also report preemptively not entering an environment where they know they will just go on for too long. So I decided, like, I'm not even going to even enter this environment because I know if I go, I'll end up going too long. While we also found apathy to link to something uh, that I was really surprised by, which was decision inertia. So what that meant in my paradigm is rather than not searching, they would just not stop. Once they started, if they search three times, they go in for fourth and fifth time. And that surprised me because I would have thought 
apathetic individuals would be too lazy to search. They'd be like, ah, I'm not going to bother. But they had no action inertia. They had decision inertia. So it seemed like the more effortful thing here to do was to actually reassess your environment and stop. And I thought that was really interesting. But the thing you can do with this ecological paradigm to actually link real life and clinical dimensions to like different psychological concepts and, and find out something surprising, like um, that their apathy was not about not pressing buttons, but about changing the way, choices they make and changing the way they act. And that, that I thought was, was quite interesting. And that maybe they didn't have any metacognitive awareness of that, I think. So um, while the OCD participants did have some somewhat awareness of what they were doing. Yeah, I, I could say that for um, the work that I've done with adolescents, uh, you don't necessarily, we didn't uh, measure their interceptive awareness, but we do see them explore more than adults and whether or not you want to ascribe that to adolescents being optimistic about the relative bounty of their environment. Um, yeah, we, we found that they did tend to explore more. So if we sort of think about adolescence as a period that's particularly risky, uh, maybe they do show this bias, this over optimism about the relative, um, yeah, the relative reward they'll get from trying out a new foraging environment. So I think that's probably all that we have time for, unless anybody else on the panel wants to ask anything else. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Yeah, no, this is really interesting. Thanks both um, for talking. We really appreciate it. Um, and thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, and actually, the next uh, episode is only a week away. This is a shorter gap this time. Um, so we hope to see everyone next week as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.